ओके सो लेट्स बिगिन सो इन द लास्ट फ्यू क्लासेस और आई मीन इन दिस कोर्स टिल नाउ वी हैव बीन लुकिंग एट हाउ टू डिसाइन ऑप एम्प्स सो वी सॉ सिंगल एंडेड आउटपुट फुली डिफरेंशियल टू स्टेज मल्टी स्टेज हाउ टू कॉम्पनसेटेड सो दैट इट्स इन इट्स स्टेबल इन नेगेटिव फीडबैक एंड स्टफ so ideally speaking if things were all nice and good uh, the course ends there and uh, you don't have to learn anything but unfortunately for you guys that's not the case because it turns out there are a whole bunch of non idealities in the real world that work against you so uh, in this in the rest of the course we'll try to look at few of them and try to see how we can tackle them and analyze them okay and these non idealities are essentially some facts of life you can't do anything about it just have to live with it okay and uh, the first non ideality or as i call it the first fact of life is that everything is non linear because you already know i mean mosfets are non linear devices but only for small signals you can approximate its behavior in a linear fashion but mind that that is also still an approximation you still have non linear terms just that for our ease of analysis we are neglecting them but there are a lot of applications where even those small non linear terms are problematic so we need to see how we can tackle them second noise is everywhere so again it turns out uh, when you are actually processing signals you will not be processing only the uh, information but we'll also have electronic noise and one major source of this noise is the random motion of the electrons due to the thermal energy it has so uh, in, for any temperature greater than 0 kelvin you will always have this random noise and the third thing is no two things or no two elements are identical there will always be some mismatch between two elements although you expect them to be identical okay so we look at all these three starting from uh, the mismatch and to appreciate the uh, or understand this effect of mismatch and uh, related stuff let's actually understand how each components are realized on a cmos ic so we'll start with uh, mos transistors i'm sure you know how uh, mos transistors are realized so we have a big p substrate and for nmos you have Two heavily doped n plus regions. It probably I'll draw it closer. And then you have the uh, oxide and the metal here, right? And now, I mean, these are source and drains. You'll have to make contact with them, so you again have some metal contacts placed on this, so that you can actually make connections. Okay. So this is the N MOS. and for tmos you start with an n well first and then you have these two p plus under the same structure okay so this is the nmos so and uh, in cmos process uh, we don't have just one metal we we'll actually have lot of metal layers and it can uh, be uh, more than 9 or 10 metal layers depending on the process we have okay and uh, the thickness of these metals this vertical thickness and the spacing between these metals they are not under your control they are basically fixed by the foundry or the process and same uh, basically all uh, dimensions in the vertical direction right in this direction they are not under your control they are fixed by the process so the only dimensions you have to play with are in these two directions so this and this okay and that is why when you draw the layouts of devices uh, you don't draw it like this this is basically the side view of the device you always look at the top view because those directly gives the two dimensions which you have control over so if i draw the same thing in the top view uh, this is the gate so we'll have the gate like this oops and then you have the source and drains like this okay and you have the contacts here 
okay, so this is the gate and one of them is source and other is drain so, okay, so uh, this is about mosfets so on for realizing a circuits besides mosfets what other elements we need huh? we have seen lot of circuits right so besides mosfets what other elements have we used yeah capacitors resistors and stuff so let's start with resistors so resistors are usually realized using a polysilicon uh, metal i mean polysilicon like this okay so this is a special polysilicon which has a high resistivity so that you can have a good resistor and let's say if i mark the dimensions like this so let us say this is the width length and thickness what is the resistance of this material yeah rho times what is the length from where can i mean this is how it is called, right yeah so what is it rho times yeah yeah what is the L what is the length here l i mean current is flow is like he asked a good question current flows here so the length is this l and what is the cross sectional area w times t yeah, and as i already mentioned this uh, vertical dimension is fixed you can't play with it and so is the resistivity that is all fixed so i'll write it like this rho by t l by w okay so this has a special name it's called the sheet resistance so all it says is what is the resistance of this material when i choose length to be equal to width right that's it so if i were to draw the 2d picture we'll have this so this is the width this is the length and if i choose my length to be equal to width the resistance of this portion is the sheet resistance okay and what is the units of this sheet resistance huh ohms it's ohms ideally i mean it is ohms right i'm saying it's a resistance of some particular block but uh, we usually say it as ohms per square just to denote that it is not the actual resistance it is the sheet resistance so what this means is see, if i know the sheet resistance here i can count how many squares i have and the sheet resistance times the number of squares gives the total resistance that's all and uh, this uh, typical value of the sheet resistance can be anywhere from 60 to 100 ohms per square okay this is some uh, rough number can easily vary from process to process great so now let us say if my sheet resistance is 100 ohms per square and i want to realize a resistance of 1 kilo ohm what should be my uh, dimensions right i mean so this gives actually infinite possibilities for lengths and w's mm -hmm. so i mean one cho choice is to take uh, this to be 10 micron and this to be 1 micron okay. but of course this is not the only choice uh, later we'll see how we might go about choosing the uh, lengths and widths individually so this is with the resistors so next uh, we need capacitors so how do you think capacitors can be realized yeah it's all nice parallel plate capacitance is the simplest you can have okay so i mean first let me show this so but remember that i already told we have multiple metal layers in the process so let us say this is the bottom two metals similarly you have a lot of metal layers like this so basically i can form the capacitance between say the bottom two metals like this i can also form the capacitance between the top two metals or somewhere in between right so uh, which of these do you think is a better thing to do should i form the capacitance between the bottom metal layers or the top metal layers okay so to help you please remember that uh, in all the process the p substrate 
remember p substrate is essentially the common substrate that is the uh, bulk or the body terminal for the nmos so where will that be connected to in the circuit p substrate is connected to the lowest potential so it's ground okay so now can you think and tell me choosing this is good or this is good okay see uh, you know that this is grounded right so whenever you form this capacitance of course you have the capacitance between the two metal plates but remember that you also have a parasitic capacitance from each of these plates to the substrate okay so whenever i say that we form a capacitor on chip you will always have parasitic capacitors from each of these plates to ground okay and of which uh, of course the bottom plate capacitance or the bottom plate parasitic will be the dominant because it is closer to the substrate so if this is the deal uh, tell me which of these two is good i know for a fact that there is going to be some parasitic capacitance from both top and bottom plates to ground to the substrate upper one seems to be better because this is much away from the substrate so makes sense that the parasitic capacitor to the substrate will also be smaller okay so usually we uh, do it in the top most metal layers see other reason is if you do it in the bottom layer you might have other metal lines going carrying some signals like this so they might easily couple with these metal lines and change the capacitance but if it's at the top most metal layers hopefully all the signal routings you might do at the lower metal layers and it's okay and usually two separate metal layers are reserved for making capacitors at the top level okay so you will have the structure like this so we'll have two metal sheets and in between you put some dielectric so if i mark the dimensions again this is length this is the width let's say this is the distance d so for this parallel plate capacitor what is the capacitance value epsilon times the area what is the area here ad again you know the vertical dimensions are uh, uncontrollable so i can take it out like this so this is i'll call it some uh, cu or unit capacitance so this is basically the capacitance per area okay and again the typical numbers are uh, 10 femtofarad per micrometer square okay. so if uh, the unit capacitance or the capacitance per area is 100 sorry 10 femtofarad per micron square if i want to realize a capacitance of 100 femtofarad what can you say about the area 10 it should be 10 micrometer square okay so again this says only the product of wl to be something so individual choice is still not clear so uh, we we'll look at it shortly and usually since the capacitors are realized in the topmost metal layers so finally if you fabricate your chips and try to see it under a microscope you will be easily able to see the things made on the topmost metal layers okay so you can easily recognize capacitors on chips same is the case with inductors because inductors will also be realized using the top metal layers and actually here so here what i have here this is basically the uh, micrograph of a chip so this was an analog to digital converter i designed few years back and this portion this is not a milk biggies biscuit okay so this is basically an array of capacitors so each of this is actually a capacitor and i mean you can clearly see it because this is made in the topmost metal layer okay so again everything which is made in the top metal layers you can easily see the transistors are all hidden under you can't see it okay cool so now uh, if you make the schematic do the layout and uh, send it for fabrication we don't fabricate one chips or two chips at a time because it's a costly process so we'll fabricate a huge uh, silicon wafer it's usually a circular wafer 
so typical dimensions are 300 millimeters and finally this uh, wafer is sliced or uh, diced if i have to use the right lingo so i'll just roughly slice it like this and each of these guys is your individual chip okay and usually this also called as the die so this is the overall wafer okay. and let's say now i take uh, one chip here and in this chip let us say i have oops yeah in uh, let's say in one chip i have uh, a resistor lot of components i have but let's say by, but i take a resistor that i have designed oops so let us say the resistor has a value 1 kilo ohm and similarly i'll consider a mosfet that i have say it has a threshold voltage of 0.4 volt and mu uh, n c ox w by l which is often called the current factor or beta this has some value say again i have a capacitor under some tofar okay, so again i have a lot of components i am taking let's say three of them now let us say uh, next to this resistor i put an identical copy of the same resistor so if i do that what do you expect the value of this resistor to be equal to yeah so if the first one i told it as 1 kilo ohm so it makes sense that this is also should be 1 kilo ohm that's what you expect okay so similarly if we have an identical transistor next to this that is also expected to have the same threshold voltage and same beta likewise if i have an identical capacitor that should also have the same capacitance value but as i mentioned in the beginning no two elements are truly identical so in practice you will find the second resistor might have a value 1 kilo ohm plus or minus some delta r and this is basically because in each in each of the steps in the fabrication process there will be something different happening for this guy and this guy you can't guarantee the same thing happens for both the elements okay one simple thing is see when you uh, the way i have drawn it now i have drawn it like a nice rectangle like this but in practice you cannot etch out nice rectangles so when you etch you will have lot of this kind of rugged shapes okay so same will happen here also so you cannot guarantee that whatever happens here will be the same that happens here also so similarly in each of these steps say you know doping ion implantation whatever that will happen differently for these two guys so the value will be slightly different and in fact in the chip if we have thousand such resistors say identical resistors you will find that their values will not be exactly equal they will be different from each other okay and let us say i take all these resistors find their values and try to plot a distribution that is a histogram where i have the resistance value in the x axis and in the y axis i plot the number of resistors having that value what distribution do you think we'll get yeah i mean it's expected because again central limit theorem you have lot of independent identically distributed random variables they lack for you know gaussian distribution here again you have lot of such non idealities giving rise to this error so you will have a gaussian distribution like this so what do you think the mean value of this will be you expect this should be 1 kilo that will be the case but on top of this mean you will have a variation with some standard deviation and stuff so likewise if you uh, do for the mosfet you have say 1000 identical mos transistors their threshold voltages will not be exactly equal again the threshold voltages will show a gaussian distribution like this with the mean equal to the nominal value of 0.4 volt same is the case with current factor also again same for the capacitance also okay 
So uh, this is called uh, random mismatch. And actually, uh, besides this random mismatch, in practice, we'll have to deal with one other variation. So I'll probably mention that also. See here, let us say I've considered uh, this chip here in the wafer, and say I had thousand identical resistors, and I find that the mean value of the resistors is say one kilo ohm here. Okay. Now let us say I take the chip here, and let's say I take one more chip at this corner. So here again I have thousand such identical resistors. Now if I take the mean value of all the resistors, I'll find that this will not be actually one kilo ohm. This will be something else. And here again, if I do the same experiment, I'll find that the mean value of the resistors is not one kilo ohm. It could be something else completely different. And again, the reason is again the variations in the process because whatever happens in this location might not exactly happen here. Okay, and not just that. Let us say this is one silicon wafer wherein I picked this chip, and I found the mean value is one kilo ohm. Let us say I process one more wafer, same design. I pick a chip at the exact identical location. Even then, I cannot guarantee that the mean value of the resistors will be one kilo ohm. This is simply because the variations in the fabrication process itself, where you cannot guarantee exact things that happened i mean we can't exact we can't guarantee that same things will happen again and again okay so the bottom line is let us say I, I pick one chip in the wafer i'll have something like this if i pick some other chip in the wafer and uh, plot the distribution of the resistor values i'll have something like this that the mean is shifted to say 1.2 kilo ohm I could have some other chip where the resistance value is smaller, say around 800 ohms. Okay, but the foundry or the process will guarantee that if I take any chip in the wafer, the mean value of the resistor will lie in some range, say from 800 ohms to 1200 ohms. So if I pick any chip randomly from the wafer, let's say one chip can have a distribution like this something else can have distribution like this but the mean value is always guaranteed to be lying in some range is that okay so this is called uh, process variation so process variation denotes the variations in the mean values of the component values we have from chip to chip Okay, or in other words, it's basically a die to die variation or chip to chip variation. Now, on top of it, if you take one particular chip around the mean value, you will go. You are going to have some variations in the resistor values, and that is due to random mismatch. Okay, so random mismatch is basically intra chip variation. Or intraday or whatever. Is it clear? Same thing will happen if you try to do this for MOSFETs. So for, even for MOSFETs, all the parameters they will have uh, variations due to both process and mismatch. So again, the process will guarantee that, say, the threshold voltage of the transistor nominally it is something. The process will guarantee that mean value of the threshold voltage will lie between a minimum and a maximum value. Same is the case with other parameters like beta and all stuff. Okay, so if let us say the threshold voltage, the current factor, and all the other parameters come as you expect, so that is called the uh, typical case. Now, if let us say the threshold voltage the you know beta everything is in such a way that the transistors uh, the current in the transistor is minimum if the current in the transistor is minimum what can you say about the speed of the device it will be slow okay so if all the parameters come in such a way that the transistor oper operates slow it is called slow 
similarly the other case what do you think this will be it should be fast it's called it so let's say i do this for nmos similarly for pmos you'll have three different cases again f t and s so in your design you'll have both nmos and pmos so you can do the permutation combination you will basically have uh, five different possibilities and usually represent it like this say this is nmos and pmos i can have a case where both of them are slow so i'll say that s and s i can have a case where the nmos is fast but the pmos is slow i can as well have a case where uh, the nmos is sorry nmos is fast sorry nmos is slow and the pmos is fast and you can have both to be fast or both to be nominal and basically here it is slow typical and fast similarly here okay so basically this gives uh, some process corners so these are called process corners actually we denote it as ss ff ss ff and t and in practice we'll have lot more process corners because that will also include the variations in the resistor values capacitor values the uh, metal lines you use for interconnection variations in the properties of those metal lines so you can have you know some ss blah 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 like first will denote for nmos second is for pmos and you can have more stuff like this depending on the process so uh, now along with this process variation as a designer you'll also have to be uh, worried about variations in the supply voltage and also variations due to temperature because you know the properties will change even if the supply voltage change and the temperature change and together these are often called the pvt variations so as a designer your job is to make sure that your circuit works even if there is some variations in pv and t so your design must be immune to these pvt variations okay cool so now let's actually get back to the uh, issue of uh, random mismatch so now we know that if i take any uh, one chip where i have thousands of identical resistors if i plot the distribution i'll have the mean to be something and the mean value can vary from chip to chip so it is some the nominal value plus or minus some x percentage of r this is due to the process variation where the mean value itself is changing okay and the typical value for this change is around uh, 10 to 20% so from chip to chip it can vary the mean value can vary from 10 to 20% or even higher it again depends on the process but if i take all the resistors in one chip around the mean they will show a gaussian distribution like this okay so the uh, actual value of each resistor is not uh, let's say i call this i call it r not and i call this r so the actual value is not equal to the mean it is going to be some the mean r plus some delta r okay so uh, delta r is basically the variations in the resistors on one chip so if i plot the distribution of delta r alone where delta r is the variations from the mean how do you think this distribution will look like it it's going to be gaussian with zero mean okay fine i mean here i have here i plotted the distribution of r plus delta r where r is the mean now i just want to see how the distribution of delta r alone is that is this this okay so i know this is gaussian distribution and has a mean of 0 so what is the other thing i need to exactly know what is the distribution ha uh, i need to know the standard deviation okay so i can find uh, sigma delta r that will define it now i take say a resistor with a mean of 1 kilo ohm and i find that the standard deviation of delta r is say uh, 10 ohms 
Now, if I uh, use the resistance value to be 100 kilo ohms as the mean, what can you say about sigma delta R? Huh? Okay, first of all, will it uh, will it be same? Will it increase or will it reduce? It will increase. I mean, at least you expect logically it will increase by 100 times. Yeah, so basically it will increase by 100 times at least logically, right? So it could be around 1 kilo. So the point I am getting at is, it is not just enough to specify what sigma delta r is. What else you need to know? You also need to know this guy. It does not make sense if I say what this, this guy is. Because it can vary depending on the mean value you have. Okay. So you need to specify both this and r. So quite often instead of specifying two, two, uh, two things separately, you normalize this and call delta r by r. So this is the relative mismatch. Okay. And we specify the standard deviation for sigma delta r by r. So this way you just need to specify one parameter and everything is taken care of. Okay. So again, if you have capacitors, again we specify sigma delta C by C. Now for MOSFETs, you know we have we can have variations due to threshold voltage and current factor. Now again, you need to specify uh, the variations in both the parameters. Now for the current factor, we again have the normalized sigma delta beta by beta. Now for threshold voltage, we usually say only sigma delta Vth. We don't normalize it with respect to the nominal value because, I mean one reason is because the, uh, the mean value of the threshold voltage depending on the type of devices could be really small. We even have devices which has close to zero threshold voltage. So it does not make sense to normalize it by dividing by the small value. So we just say the deviation from the nominal value there. So these are the uh, parameters that we will be given with and depending on this we will have to make our designs. So now let us get back to our uh, initial question that is say I have a sheet resistance of 100 ohms per square and let us say I want to realize a resistor of 1 kilo ohm. I can find what is the ratio L by W that is 10. But it does not say anything about how should I choose my individual length and width, right? So let us try to get some understanding about that. Say, uh, say I realize this 1 kilo ohm resistor using some value of width and length. Oh, no, no, not just that, we will come to that. No? So, and let us say for if I do this, I find that I have some relative mismatch sigma delta r by r. Okay. Now, you know I can realize the same resistor by using twice the length and twice the width, right? Ratio is going to be same. So what we will do, we will try to take this choice. So here again, the nominal value of the resistor is going to be R, okay? But this will have some mismatch delta R prime. So we will try to find what is this sigma delta R prime by R and compare it with this guy and see which is better. Okay, and uh, and uh, this resistor of uh, twice the length and twice the width, I will draw it in a slightly different way like this. So say this is the original resistor which had a width W and length L. I will take four copies like this. Okay, and. Uh, and I will connect it like this. See, for all that matters, the effective width is 2w, effective length is 2 times the original length. And these are all, assume that these are all like ideal short, short circuits. 
So it is as though I have actually put two W and two L, where I have split it like this. That's all. Okay. I'll uh, tell you why uh, we are doing it like this. So is this clear that uh, this will realize a resistor with twice the length and twice the width? Is this point clear? Okay. So now nominally, you know, these all of them will have R, R, and R. So if you want to model it, I'll have something like this. Right. So this will be R, 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 and R. So of course now you see this is 2R and 2R. In parallel we get the original R. Okay, but uh, of course uh, we'll have mismatches in each of these resistors. Like this. So let's try to find the actual value of uh, this resistor. So let us say I call it R effective. I know R effective is going to be the nominal value R plus some delta R prime. So our goal is to find this delta R prime. Okay. So first let's calculate what is the total resistor here. So what is the total resistor in the top side? Yeah. So I'll write it here. Say this R top. That is 2R plus delta R1 plus delta R2. Similarly, at the bottom, I'll have same thing 2r plus delta r 3 plus delta r 4 so my effective resistor is the parallel combination of the two and probably i'll move it to the next page so i'll write it like this inverse of the resistor is 1 by r top okay so i'll replace uh, the value of r top here 1 by 2r plus delta r1 plus delta r2 okay so uh, i'll take two times r common everywhere so if i take two times r out what will i have huh? 1 plus okay. similarly I will have now note that all my delta r case how do you think it compares with the nominal value r huh? it should be much much smaller okay so the ratio delta r by r is much much smaller than 1 so we'll use that. So now it looks like I have a case where I have 1 plus. This is basically much much smaller than 1. Both of these guys. So for small values of x, what is 1 plus x? I mean 1 by 1 plus x? 1 minus x. So I'll uh, use that approximation. So then this becomes 1 minus delta r1 say plus delta r2 by 2 r. So here again I have 1 plus, sorry, minus delta R3, 2 R. So I will rewrite it like this. This is 2. Okay, same thing. So if I take uh, this, this is basically 1 by the R effective. So if I take 1 by 2 R inside, I have 1 by R in the first term. What is the second term? I think did I make a mistake here? Or no. I made some mistake somewhere. Okay, no? The dimension, yeah, correct. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll oh sorry, what I'll do is I'll just take uh, I'll just take 1 by 2 inside. So what will I have? I'll have 1 by R times 1 minus 
by four times r. So this is still the inverse of the resistor. Once again, I'll invert it to get the actual value. I'll again use the same thing. Here again, I'll have one minus a small value of x. So one by one minus x is one plus x. Okay, so let me copy this. So then if I do R effective is R into 1 plus this thing, that's all. Okay. So from this, uh, what is the uh, delta R prime? Yeah, yeah, what is the value? It's basically the average of all the four deltas. Okay. So I'm interested in finding the relative mismatch. So I'll again divide it by R. So I'm now interested to find the standard deviation, this guy. Okay. So first I'll find the uh, mean square value, sigma square, and then take the square root. So if I take the sigma square of this, and uh, please remember that all these delta R's, they are all uncorrelated. Because these are mismatches happening in four different resistors or four different parts of the you know uh, resistor, so they have no relation with each other. If uh, these are uncorrelated, and what is the mean of delta R? No, no, delta R. Delta R. We decoupled the mean value, so it, it was basically a zero mean Gaussian process. Mean is zero. If uh, mean is 0 and if I say uh, they are uncorrelated, what can you say about expected value of delta r1 times delta r2? It is a product of the individual expectations which is what? Uh, yeah, I mean this is basically, yeah, yeah you are right this is what it is. If it is uncorrelated the pro expectation of the product is product of the individual expectations, but the individual expectations are themselves 0. Okay, So this is going to be 0, fine. So this is my, uh, have that in mind, I will copy this. So I will to find the mean square, I will take expected value of delta r prime by r square, right. So I'll have expected value of this thing squared. So I'll first take the uh, oops, the constant out, 1 by 16 r square comes out into expected value of r1 plus delta r2. Square. Now I'll here I'll have uh, delta r1 square, delta r2 square. Plus I'll have cross terms like delta R, I mean delta R1, delta R2, things like that. Okay. So if I take the expected value, I know the expected value of all these cross terms, they'll go to zero. I'll be left only with these guys. Is that okay? So finally this will boil down to expected value of uh, delta R1 square plus delta R4 square. In our square and all four of them are having the same distribution with the same standard deviation. So this will be equal to the sigma square of oops. I write it like this. So this is uh, this will be simply equal to the okay. because all of them will have the same mean square value, all of them have the same distribution. So it's basically 4 times the mean square value of the individual stuff, 16 r square. So this I'll write it as 1 fourth of sigma delta r. Okay. No, I mean, uh, see, 
I have written it like this. This is basically sigma of delta r by r square of the. It's a constant value, right? R is a constant. So instead of dividing uh, r square, I mean instead of dividing sigma square of delta r with r square, I can also think of it as sigma square of delta r by r. So this is basically, I mean, what I have written is expected value of I have delta r square divided by r square. I basically return it as expected value of delta r by r the whole square. Okay. So this is basically the uh, mean square value of my delta r prime by r. So what is the standard deviation? Half. Okay. So the effective standard deviation for the relative mismatch I have is one half of delta r by r. So the bottom line is, see, I, uh, this corresponded to the resistor realization where I had a length L and a width W. So this had, this has the standard deviation. But now if I realize the same resistor using twice the length and twice the width, I seem to be having this as the standard deviation, which is smaller or larger, which is smaller compared to my original realization. So if, if, you, if I were to give a choice among these two, what would you choose? You will choose having a larger area. Okay. So from this it should be clear, uh, if I say delta r by r, it reduces with the area. Okay. So how do you think it reduces with the area? It is proportional, inversely proportional to the area. Yeah. 1 by what should, what should come here? If I increase both w and l, if I increase both by 2x, my sigma reduces by 2x. Okay. And this is in fact the case and uh, the actual relation is, can have a constant, so not a bt, call it a r. This is in fact true for all the standard deviations, if you have some sigma delta c by c, you can say it as wn. Similarly, sigma vth, that, will, that is also some a vth by root wl. And, uh, even the current factor mismatch follows the same relation. And I mean, this is not a very solid proof what I have showed you, it is just one example and uh, I took an example to uh, make you understand the result. So in fact, one guy had rigorously proved this and this is often called Pelgrom's model or Pelgrom's law. Okay. So now it should be clear, uh, you know if I have to realize some resistance, say I don't know, uh, 1 kilo ohm, I have a sheet resistance of 100 ohms per square, I know what is my L by W that is 10. Now the values of these guys right, A R, A C, A V T H and A beta, they are dependent on the process. If your process is very good, this will be really small. So from the process you know this relation. So you know what is sigma delta r by r, sigma delta r by r is some a r by root w l. So in your design, let us say you can tolerate some level of mismatch. So that gives you some information about delta r by r. So from this you find what is the area you need. And from then you can actually find the individual values of lengths and widths. Is that okay? So the bottom line is uh, the first equation for finding the dimensions you get from the sheet resistance or the capacitance per unit area. Now for uh, finding what is the uh, actual width and length, you rely on the mismatch data. So in your design you will know you can tolerate some amount of mismatch. From that information about delta r and the value of this a r, which you can obtain from the process, you can decide what should be my individual width and length. Okay. Cool. And yeah, so let's stop here.
think that's about it. Okay, one last thing. So, what do you think the units of this is? AR? I just say that. Huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, what is the units of this? Huh? No, it cannot be meter, right? See, uh, what is the units of this? Standard deviation of something. Huh? What is the units of this? What is the unit of delta r by r? It's a unitless, right? So this also unitless. So what do you think this is? It should be a micrometer. Okay. So what is the units of this? Yeah, because this has dimensions of volts. Threshold voltage is not normalized. So this is basically volt. So this will be some volt micrometer. Okay. So we'll stop here. Yeah.